All right. So we have identified fundamentals for alpine skiing, snowboard, cross-country, telemark, adaptive. Fundamentals, the core value of what we're looking for technically. Fundamentals for what we're looking for in your teaching and fundamentals for what you do uh, for your people skills and how you relate to people. But how do you, how do you mark some of these people skills? Um, so separating people skills from teaching skills is a new innovation for us this year. And so this is a work in progress. We're using fits and positive stages of motor skill learning, which basically says that anybody who's learning, learning a new skill moves from a cognitive stage where they're thinking about it, just like when we did the agility drill, I gotta really use my brain to, to make this happen, where we move from cognitive to associative, where you don't have to think quite as much about it until you're completely autonomous, you're an expert, and it requires very little thinking to do the thing. Those are basically the stages, and then we assess those stages or throw a score on those stages, right? So if you were to perform a task, let's say there's a, a level one exam, you're doing a V1, and it really, like you really have to think, like you can just see that it's not a fluid movement, that you don't really own it, you're gonna probably score a one or two. Until you, and that's the cognitive stage, and then you get a three or four if you're in the associative phase, and then we would give you a score of five or six if you're in the autonomous phase. Does that make sense? And so we're throwing these scores one through six, and we're asking our instructors to get to a level thumb. So we are, again, trying to consolidate, collaborate, and make this um, a more standard, standardized uh, process. We're working with Penn State, a university in the United States, um, to create learning outcomes so that this whole process is more standardized across the U.S. We take our technical skills here, this is everything that we value in the U.S. and how we organize it, push off, weight transfer, glide, those are the things that are unique to cross-country skiing in our estimation. And the stuff that's in the middle, well that's all the ingredients to sports performance. So would you guys want to do a little exercise with me? I think we have time. All right, so go ahead and stand up. Sports qualities of all sports, whether we're playing basketball, ping pong, or we're actually skiing, it requires body position, fundamental movements like flexion and extension, how you time those movements, how you coordinate them, and then power, which is the speed and force, right? How slow and easy you do it, or hard and fast you do it. So that's the ingredients to all sports. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to teach you a new sport. All right, here are the movements that, that if we just looked at the, uh, the triangle of our movements, of our sport, here's how it goes. So everybody do this with your hand. Your right hand is going in a circle, right? Now take your left hand and make the same circle. All right, again, this is going to be all the movements to our sport. Now go the opposite direction. Good. And then with your other hand, the opposite direction. All right, great. So you can do all of those movements. But they don't really mean anything until we start to coordinate those movements. So we're going to do them both hands together. One direction. Go the opposite direction. All right, really good. It's still not our sport, right? Just to elucidate this power and speed. So let's go soft and easy. Okay, let's go hard at the top. Bam. All right, so now we're adding more force and power. Good, all right. Still not our sport exactly. Here's, here's the sport. Here's the thing that I want you to do. I want one hand to go one direction and the other hand to go the opposite direction. <laughs> that's why I paddled on a, like, in a kayak. <laughs> that, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Mix it nice. Spaceman going the same direction. Alright, now, but if you want it. <laughs> yes, yes. Alright, now, if you want to be good at this sport, right? Because that's like, that's like having one gear. You want to be able to do this both directions, right? You want to be able to do it slow and then add power to it. You want to own these movements, all of these sports qualities here in the middle of the triangle to produce, to then take this out into the field of play, whatever that is. Of course, there is no field of play. It's <laughs> the dance floor. Yeah, right. It's the dance floor. You guys can, can sit down. So this is, and then I mean, you can use your whole body and do this. And it's basically, we take this triangle 
overlay it on our sport of cross country skiing, and then we try to describe the flexion and extension movements, how we coordinate those movements, and how we apply power to those movements to get glide, push off, and weight transfer. Okay, so that's our, our technical sports model and what we're grading on. Let's get that. Okay, so we're throwing that fits at that one through six scoring on all of these elements. People skills, technical skills, and teaching skills. All right, so that's kind of where we are in PSIA and a little bit of what our certification looks like. Any questions on that? Uh, just one on the technical skills you did mention about assessing that, and I guess you're still, I heard that you're still working through that. Yes. So yeah. that would be quite an interesting one. As to what point do we, we've, that's something we've never, it's been intuitive, we've never really filed ski instructors. Have Zach, we? you got it, man. That's exactly right. Like, we're going to let you know and let you know yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, really how, how this goes, yeah. right? But this is what we value, are those people skills. And now we're trying to not just take it to a lip service, but actually, how do you train somebody to have better people skills? Mm. Or is that really a school, you know, responsibility as an employer? I and mean, that's an interesting question. I think we got, well, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll see. You know yeah, I mean? exactly. yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. And, and what was really fun is figuring out four or five bullet points that we're looking for yeah. that you can separate from teaching. They're two different things. Um, all right, yeah. Greg is going to now talk about what we did on snow with agility drills and how that comes back to everything that we're doing in PSIA. Just before Go you sit. do the people skills, I, I think that the trend towards uh, introducing the training of people skills, as you're stating it in here, um, is well needed to balance out what I've observed where people will come in with the high technical uh, skill, and the dominance is on all, they can perform well. So to see another layer in there to be supporting them, I think is making it much more well Because we had that conversation earlier. Yeah, frequently it can come in and someone knows how to ski well, and then they just feel that they can move quite easily into uh, teaching and might move through getting their certifications quite quickly because they can demonstrate well, but not necessarily ski. Like a racer so, who comes yeah. in, awesome skier, but not a great teacher. And, yeah. and that's just, we're trying to help them formulate the whole picture. Yeah, I mean, those questions, you guys, are awesome because those are exactly the discussions we had as a team. And not, when I say team, it's not Dave and Emily and I, it's a team of all Alpine, Snowboard, Telmark, Adaptive, and Cross Country within PSIA. We started having the discussions coming out of Ushuaia, and you're just kind of seeing where we went from Ushuaia to here, to Bulgaria, where we're at on these things. And so, identifying some of those things of Imagine going back to a lesson you had and you're like, wow, I had an awesome experience with that person, but did I learn anything? That might person might have been awesome on their people skills, where you might have gone to a lesson and you'd be like, wow, they're a really awesome skier, but man, I didn't get anything from them, or they taught me a ton, but he's kind of a jerk. That's kind of the person that doesn't have much people skills. And so we started saying, all right, an ideal, perfect instructor is gonna have all of those. And this is where we came up with these fundamentals, and I'm gonna actually dive into those fundamentals and what we did on the snow, and how as cross country, what we're doing right now, unfortunately you guys are missing an entire presentation on people skills, an entire presentation on um, teaching skills, um, or there might be a time to get over to one of those at 450, um, that you're gonna go deeper to that. So hopefully you have a person from your delegation going to those and you can share back on it. But we're looking at how does those agility drills that we did on snow help us as instructors of instructors teach those teaching skills, people skills, and technical skills to our instructors before they go out and actually either take one of our exams or eventually go out and teach um, some students. So let's quickly, and I'm really gonna fly through some of these things because we're gonna be short on time and I wanna get to more of the meat of it. Um, we're going into principles of skill acquisition. As instructors, we're there to help and assist our students learn new skills retain those skills for a long period of time, and then be able to transfer those skills to something else that they want to apply it to. So it doesn't even always need to be the skill of, of you know, stepping sideways in our agility drills, but how does that translate into um, actually skiing? So we want to have that. That's kind of our, our role as an instructor. We talked a lot about open and closed environments and open and closed tasks, just to kind of bring that into that skill acquisition. A closed environment is any environment that is really predictable, okay? Being on snow is already an open environment versus bowling. It's a really closed environment. 
um, but we can have a variation of close and open in there as well as their tasks as we go through. Um, we also talk about open environments and the more open the environment is, the higher level of skill acquisition that happens and the longer the retention that happens. So again, more openness, more variability that comes into there, more movement patterns that we can link to it, gives our students the ability to change and go forward and adapt to what they need to learn and retain that information they've gone forward. So again, a good graphic of showing close and open. There's a spectrum of every drill and task and learning environment we're in is going to be either some form of closed or some form of open. A lot of times we start with very closed drill, dry land, standing and being in our body position. We might put on our skis, now this makes it slightly more open. Skiing in the track is a very closed drill compared to skating on the side of track versus doing our agility drills or going and doing a powder run on, a, on your cross country skis or whatever it is. So all of those fit into that agility or into that spectrum of open and closed where we're trying to get people to that open task for better skill acquisition for the long-term retention of your movements patterns. Okay? So like I said, we're doing it through agility drills. Um, so what does that really mean? Just to kind of give you a context before that, so we're all on the same page. Agility drills come from strength and conditioning world. An agility drill is anything that requires us to accelerate, decelerate, or change direction while keeping our body position in the same movement. So we want to be effective and efficient in that movement and in changing its directions. Think about it as a football player having to stop and cut. Okay, so we're taking that from the dry land world of footballers, maybe track and field people, to the snow and why we're doing that. So what does agility drills do when we're training? What does it do for us? It improves our balance. How many people here know that as cross country skiers, balance is probably our number one problem. So we're really working on that. We're working on some of that body-body connection. We're wiring some new motor pathways. We are enhancing our proprioception, getting our kinesthetic awareness, so we know that visual perception as well, so we have a better reaction time, so we can re relax and re um, react to that open environment that's coming at us, so we learn and move forward and have that skill acquisition longer. Um, let's play this. This is you guys as um, we are starting to use this, and as, as this is playing, like I said, we will connect our agility drills to our education of our instructors. Um, so this is some agility drills that we're doing at instructor clinics now. And like I said, we're trying to bring this in, and I'm, this is what's going to happen after this, is I'm going to show you how it enhances both our technical skills knowledge, our people skills knowledge, and our teaching skills knowledge. And this is how, you know, we have those five, um, six fundamentals of each of those. Um, how do we teach those? And this is one way as instructors, of instructors, we're getting to teach our um, instructors how to be better instructors using that learning connection model. So, different fun, it's done, done different drills that um, we, you guys did not see. Um, we just showed you guys three on snow, but there's a lot of different ones that you can do as we uh, ski around. It's a good place to practice agility skills in the biathlon range. Yeah, yeah, it was right at the biathlon range. Yeah, no shooting. Don't worry, we're right in there yet. Who's not good shooting? Yeah, no, yet. Yeah. So, all right. So agility drills kind of gave you some back background on skill acquisition um, and the agility drills. So let's. How does this tap into each one of these components of our learning connection model? All right. So first of all, it really helps us to get our instructors in tune to our technical skills. Okay, we've come up with some fundamentals about our technical skills. We have the push out weight transfer glide as those skills. We've put in some fundamentals underneath all of them. Um, so we have five fundamentals now that we're kind of playing around with as we're going through. We're pretty confident that the center of mass over the base of support to direct pressure along the length of the ski is really what we're really been focused on this past year. If we can get our instructors to play with agility drills and start really feeling this and honing in and their knowledge of those technical skills is a unique way to have them have better retention of that knowledge and those skills going forward. Secondly, kind of more in depthly, how does agility drills help us teach our teachers to have these six fundamentals of good teaching skills? So we'll highlight some of that. First of all, a good teacher creates an environment that has exploration and play involved in it. Can't tell me that agility drills aren't fun. You're exploring new movement patterns. 
exploring something unique. Okay, so the good teacher, we're creating some of that going forward. Okay, another one is it's going to require us, and we're going to require our teachers to learn how to help them recognize and connect what they're doing in those agility drills to how it applies to what they're learning and going forward. Okay, so we're going to have that connection of experiential learning and experiencing the new sensations that are unique to what their movement patterns are. Okay. I might have noticed I skipped over one, because again, part of that recognition and reflection has to come back to the long-term and short-term goals of the student. Remember in our learning connection model, students in the center? Those reflections of good teachers are always going to relate it back to those goals, the short and long-term goals of the student. Okay, so that kind of helps with that going forward. A huge thing about agility drills is managing not just the terrain, but the information you're giving them, the tasks you're giving them. I'm not going to take a 70-year-old beginner woman and have her go down a powder slope because that's the most agility thing. I might still have her do some sidestep because I'm learning as a teacher to give that information and those activities that are appropriate to that person and manage that in an appropriate manner. So again, a good way of learning some of those teaching skills by utilizing a lot of agility drills. Similar to that of facilitating learning, but we're also going to enforce some of the learning that we're going to do. Um, so again, we reinforce our learning and our effort. It's really easy to give encouragement and give feedback to our students when they're doing a unique thing and they're having fun. Good teacher is going to have some of those in their aspects. And then finally, we're going to manage our emotional risk, our emotion and our, and our physical risk. Okay, so a good teacher is going to be aware and manage how a person is struggling and frustrated with it. They're also going to pick terrain that is appropriate to manage their risk so they're not getting hurt. Okay, so these are things that you can see in agility drill that's going to highlight some of those teaching skills um, that makes up a good teacher. People skills. How do agility drills help with people skill? So step back a little bit as we were working as one whole team, developing these and coming up with these fundamentals of teaching and people skills. We had a lot of discussion about what makes a good teacher also makes a good people person, and what makes a good people person makes them a good teacher. So it was really struggled to pull those two apart to make our fundamentals. And we realized once we did that, that gave us our fundamentals that we can now evaluate somebody on. But we knew that they're going to overlay each other right away. So again, we, we can start identifying somebody that might not have a good people skill, who might have a good teaching skill. Now we can say what they need to work on and what they need to educate. But let's go through these four, four people skills and how agility drills helps us teach some of those people skills that we want to see in a great instructor. First uh, fundamental that we have with people skills is develop a relationship based off of trust. You have to effectively to effectively administer agility drills or use it as a teaching tool, you have to have that emotional connection and that trust with your student on whatever level that's going to be. So again, the trust is needed to inspire your students to do this unique movement. Okay, so by training and using agility drills, you're going to learn how to have that relationship um, with your students. You're also going to have to have really good two-way communication. It's not just us telling them what the drill is. Okay? We're going to have to have them giving our feedback. Having that good emotional connection and good two-way communication. People are going to struggle. They're going to have emotional reaction to that. And if you're not aware and responding to that with good people skills, it's not going to be an effective lesson. And agility drills really gets us to get people to struggle as they go through. Okay? We're going to have to understand and identify our own emotions. A lot of times instructors, we evaluate ourselves based off the success of our students. And we emotionally get upset with ourselves. And we're going to have to see that because we're putting our students into a really challenging position. And we're going to have to learn how to manage our emotional connection that they're not being successful with it. Okay, so we're really highlighting that ability to, to um, address our own emotional connection to our success as an instructor. Because it's not our success. It's the whole system of success. Okay. And then finally, we're going to have to recognize and influence the dynamics of the, a group, especially when we have a group lesson. Agility drills can be done on a private lesson, but it's more fun when it's a group. And you're going to start having people that feel like they're great skiers. 
they think they're the top of the group. Now they're doing an agility drill and they're not so comfortable anymore. The social dynamic might have just got switched. Okay. Um, I'm not going to call out, but in that video sequence that we put together of uh, when we were in West Yellowstone, there's one instructor in there that was really good at some of the early drills. Agility drills are not so good on the other ones. And to be a good instructor, you have to start recognizing that. I mean, we were, I was there, I know that person personally. And to be able to do that and recognize that in the social context and see how he's adjusting and how social network is happening, you're going to have to adjust and have really good people skills to do that. So it's really cool to use agility drills as a tool for us to train our instructors um, to have these really good people skills. Like anything that we have as a tool, there's some potential issues that happen with using these as a drill. But if we have used them effectively and our, our instructors are using learning connection models at a very high level and have the best teaching skills and people skills and technical skills for that matter, these potential issues are going to be solved with that learning connection models. So again, the task and the environment might be too open, meaning there might be too much chaos for somebody at their mental, you know, personal connection with it, they might be very type A, they want a lot of structure. I can't, I don't fit into this openness and this chaos. Okay? So now as a good instructor, instructor, you're gonna have the tools to recognize that and be able to close down that environment to help either that instructor, that coach, or your student going forward. Okay? You might have students, or we as instructor educators might have instructors that are very closed mindset, meaning I'm not, I can't do that, or I'm only good at doing this type of teaching. Um, agility drills allows us to coach that instructor away from that closed mindset and more of a growth and open mindset. Utilizing those tools, utilizing more movement patterns. I'll never be able to have the balance to be too very well. Well, let's, let's try some of these agility drills where you open that mindset up, get them away from that. Gets into that growth mindset of, oh, I can balance better. Hey, now I might be able to do a V2 sprint type of thing. So it really allows us to identify those closed and open mindsets and move past some of those. Sometimes we have learning stop when the connection doesn't found there. Okay, so agility drills are one of those things where it's easy to start pulling out drills. If you have a menu of drills, it's really easy to just say, go, oh, I go to this one, and then I go to this one, and this go. We don't have that connection from one to the next one. So with agility drills, by highlighting different parts of those technical fundamentals and having our instructors really understand those technical fundamentals by utilizing some of our agility drills, they can start keeping that connection happening so learning can keep happening and skill acquisition can keep happening. So it's a good way to, to have them find those connections of agility drills back to their normal scheme when they go out and skiing. One thing that we were doing as instructors, we were having you guys do an agility drill and we had you go skiing. Come back and do the agility drill, go and ski it. Always connecting that learning back to your normal scheme. Another direction. Okay? And finally, skier's ability is not going to be able to meet the task. We know that our instructors, as they go through our certification process, that their skiing ability increases. So their ability to do different and more complex drills is going to increase. So we're by having that ability to scale our tasks and our, our, our agility drills, are going to be able to help our instructors, one, improve their own scheme, as well as their teaching and their knowledge about technical maneuvers going forward. So, kind of in a wrap, we brought and created, started with this learning connection models in Ushuaia. As an entire team, we really started flushing out the teaching and the people skills. We found those fundamentals. We're establishing a universal kind of scorecard using bits and positives, um, stages of learning with a one to six scale on that. We will, like David said, wait till levy. Hopefully by then we will have something on how we actually truly are evaluating people and teach those skills. That is on the plate and moving forward, going I mean, live and active people are working on it right now. Um, and then we just wanted to bring in how in cross country skiing we use agility drills to possibly get to those people where we're going to say, hey, how do we evaluate their teaching skills, their people skills? 
Because once again, we can say what the fundamentals of a good teacher are, but how do we teach a good teacher to become one? Um, and it's, we also know that people can learn to be a, have better people skills as they go forward. Um, so, does anybody have any questions? I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Frank. Have you, um, have you ever come across the book, The Inner Game of Tennis? Which was that? The Inner Game of Tennis. I have personally have not, but this man right here is a and tennis is a star. Like Tim Gall, yeah. That came out after that called The Inner Game of Skiing. Mm -hmm. it's about, it just sort of struck a chord with it, that comment around, um, you know, in those soft skills around mindset. And that's always an issue, I guess, for all of us, particularly as we start to go to more complex and difficult skills. And uh, they're really worth reading. The very old books are produced in the 70s, but it, they were one of the first books about what they call this appreciative mindset. There's a whole learning theory, theories around appreciative mindset, where you focus uh, on what's working, not what's not the deficit, on what's and reward and um, support what's going well as opposed to what's not working. Sometimes we, certainly as instructors, we might focus on the deficit or what's not happening as opposed to what is happening. So anyway, just, uh, it just occurred to me that's really actually quite a, a fundamental area around that mindset issue. It, it can hold us back and hold our students back. Um, and often perhaps that's what maybe why they don't come back to the sport mm -hmm. because they don't get through that. You know, they have this negative view of themselves as skiers when they find how hard it is and, and struggle with it. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out, and um, and I and I, you know, I think it's fantastic that you're building that into into and, your model there. And that's one of those. That is one of those skills as a good instructor that kind of bridges that people skills and teaching skills of of being able to have that good, effective two-way communication mm. is a good people skill. But then also coming back and being able to reinforce what they're learning and their efforts. Okay, so identifying what they're doing well instead of always focusing on, hey, you need to check this, you need to check this. If that's your teaching strategy and your feedback strategy, it's going to turn somebody out pretty quickly. So having that ability to reward their efforts and their successes as well as finding ways to give them feedback on what their corrections are. So again, that's one of those, when we were talking about very similar things and we had different analogies going forward, separate those out and how do I evaluate those two but then bring them back. Because you could have you know, the, the feedback sandwich of positive, corrective, positive, but do it without a really good two-way communication. You check the teaching skill side, you didn't check the people skill side. So those are kind of, as we're getting onto that level going forward. So. I understood that this is an ongoing project. Mm -hmm. and it looks wonderful and easy to understand. <coughs> Can I ask if you have had some uh, real life experience about the evaluation process? Uh, so, for example, in a ski school, have you ever tried to, to do the evaluation of, of instructor, uh, instructors according to these uh, points? Mm. Or, or is the future? Did you give an exam recently, or you, where we use these? Where we use them in, in say, like a certification process? Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are certainly ways that. Um, you know, you can see if someone is acquiring a skill, um, and I throw them in in certain environments, even in certifications, because in fact, in our um, team tryouts, we did a lot of uh, agility drills to to get on this team, and the you know to understand where we are with skills. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think the environment um, can be really versatile, and uh, for me using them, it's, it's the comfort level of when to bring them in, when is it appropriate, and I think um, there's a lot of situations where they can be really effective. Mm -hmm. um, you if, in, if you're asking not just agility drills, but the scoring. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, on the cross-country side, implemented this yet. Mm -hmm. Dave, can you speak to it on the Alpine side or snowboard side? Well, is your question specific to teaching and people and, uh, and assessing those two pieces more so than the technical? Was that your, more your question? Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, in teaching, we, we assess like the establishing rapport and, and can you create a learning environment? Can you do those types of things? That's, we've scratched the surface a little bit there with, on the people skills side of things, but we're looking to how do we actually then create some assessment activities 
truly for, for people skills. Mm -hmm. right. So that's, well, that's what's um, in progress right now. If that was so more you your question. You haven't begun that yet. You just, you just have kind of uh, documented out how you want to do you're, it. Mm -hmm. You're seeing the start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because yeah. yeah. remember the eight divisions that I showed you. It's yeah. going to take some time to bring everybody on board because we have to have every division's buy-in to change our scoring criteria. But that's the yeah, you know, and your question about the schools, should it happen in the schools or not? When thinking about job skills analysis of the job that they're hiring, we're validating those skills, right? We're certifying those people. So we, we're saying, we're giving them a stamp of approval to say, you should hire this person. They have these skills and people skills, interpersonal skills, the ability to bring guests back and connect at a deeper level. Those are what our ski schools are saying to us. We want those people. So please, can you train them and can you validate them in those skills? Perhaps I could offer, um, I don't actually look at it, I'm sure we're appreciate getting short of time, but yeah. in Australia, I'm not just a red skin, but in the outdoor recreation industry, we have gone down the Compsy model, we've been there down 20 years, and we've actually developed competencies uh, for all these things, facilitation skills, you know, these soft skills. Uh, I, have, I haven't looked at it for a while, pull it out and send it to you if it's of some value because it does have assessment criteria in there mm. and it might be something that might be useful when you're building your own uh, model as yeah, well. Be great. I'm yeah. happy to send that on. Yeah. We, we work with the, mm. the Aussies and we have some of our teammates who have they gone through that process? Yeah. yeah. They uh, through the Australian process. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Heidi in particular. Heidi, yeah. yeah. I, as you talk about the people skills as well, by the way, what if it, is it responsibility of this organization or is it the employer that the ski instructors are at? Well, the units are constantly generally delivered by what we call uh, technical and further education institutions and they get certification. So it's actually done by the training institution and the, the employer expects them to, they're all bundled together, these units. So they may not be delivered on the same course, they're obviously linked. And My so, so, so to answer your question, delivered by the training institution. Well, I, I was just thinking though of the continuity of your instructors. Then, though, if you are taking it on to be training the people skill, then you know the consistency of the training of this people skill versus the employer of the hill, because that can be one hill or one place could be very enthusiastic, another one not so much, another one doesn't have the time to budget. Yeah. So taking it under your umbrella, I think, will and that goes, add, add the consistency that you're looking for. And works. that goes back to the three C's that David talked at the beginning. Right. right. The, the consistency across the country. When, when we're driven by the marketplace, right, an open marketplace, our ski schools are saying these are the things that we value and that we want in an instructor and we're certifying instructors so we're trying to make psia more valuable to the marketplace mm -hmm. and if we only concentrated on technical yeah. we wouldn't be as valuable to those ski schools they'll do whatever training they do but we are we are forced to be relevant and stay relevant and we expand Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we can't just do, rely on lip service. Got to put some, something of substance behind it. Great. Right. Other questions? Okay. Cool. Have, sorry. Yeah. I would have one, but do you have time after this, or do you, are you going on yourself? It, we're, we'll be we're, around we're, the we're, we're, we're going to go next in this room. But we can step outside. And, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah.